What's up, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast presented by Zaxby's. I'm Scott Baer alongside Tori McElhaney and Taryn Walk, and we are here on a Friday morning. After, I am running off of pure caffeine. After a late Thursday night with some major news from the Atlanta Falcons that broke among media outlets, Taryn, yes. we'll say about 4.49. 4.49 p.m. And and it was formally announced by the team at what? 8.48? 8.48. 8.48. Are insane. <laughs> we like the symmetry. Time matters. Um, and the big news is that the Falcons have hired their 19th head coach in franchise history, someone that Falcons fans know well, someone that Tori covered when she was with The Athletic, Raheem Morris. So we're going to break down that decision from every angle. We're going we're gonna to dive into the what was a very extensive Falcons head coaching search. Very. And go through everything that you need to know about Raheem Morris, what he's going to bring to the table, and everything that we learned about the Falcons over, astonishingly, only the last two. It's been two and a half weeks. That's insane. Two and, two and a half weeks and a half since, years, since the Falcons parted ways with Arthur Smith, Gosh. and now they have a new head coach. So let's just dive right into it. I think it's like what January was, 38th. I know. Exactly. <laughs> uh, general reactions general reaction uh, to Raheem Morris returning to the Falcons coaching staff. Yeah, I I think this is something that a lot of people within the organization, I know for me personally too, it's pretty exciting. Um, I think that Raheem Morris is somebody who, even though things didn't work out for him in his first three seasons with Tampa Bay as the head coach there, I, I do think that it, he's a person and he's a coach that as he has garnered more experience, more time in the league, I mean, you look at all the different positions he's coached and he's been a coordinator. And I, I think that the three seasons that he had in Tampa Bay is not as indicative of who the Falcons are getting now. You think about how many years have passed and how much growth. He's 32. Right. And and I know, like, from having spoken to him before about this, that time in Tampa Bay, because I know a lot of people on Twitter and everything are talking about, like, oh, like, you could have hired Bill Belichick, who's the winningest coach in, you know, the history of the NFL, but you hire somebody who spent three years in Tampa Bay and didn't put together a, a winning season. He did. He was 10 and 6 10 in and year six. two. Okay. But 17 and 31 overall. Right, yeah. yes. So it's like, okay, this is why Why should we be excited about this? You should be excited about this because that those three seasons are very different from where this person is now. And I think that, from, uh, what was it, 2002 to right. now? I would hope everyone's grown since right, then. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I, I think there should be this level of excitement. Also, the fact that there was so much just, we haven't talked to players, but just from their social medias and kind of seeing their Instagram posts and their Twitter reactions and everything like that, it seemed like they were they're excited about this hire. Definitely. And I yeah. know from, you know, there are guys here who, have been taught and coached by Raheem. Grady Jarrett being one of them, Jake Matthews, Chris Lindstrom, AJ Terrell. I mean, all these guys were here when Raheem was here as an interim head coach three seasons ago. It feels like a lifetime because Raheem Morris went out and went to the Rams in LA and won a Super Bowl with them. The Falcons have completely reholed their entire organization from a salary cap standpoint, from a defensive standpoint. They brought in Kyle Pitts, Drake London, Bajon Robinson. They're still looking for a quarterback, yes, but this entire roster has been retooled from the time that Raheem Morris was here to the time he is now. So I think just overall, I, I, I would just like caution people to jump to conclusions because the Falcons say they're in win-now mode and they went out and looked. They went through 14 candidates to try and find somebody who – could lead this team to winning now. They believe it to be Raheem Morris. So let's see what can happen. I think there's reason to be hopeful. I went back and forth because seeing the players' reactions, it made me think, like, what am I missing here? But I didn't cover him in yeah. 2020 or before that. Um, I was working in the NASCAR industry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But with that said, they're excited, and I think that sometimes matters the most when they can rally behind someone brand new and it comes in with that excitement. But to play devil's advocate, 
I go back thinking, well, why didn't this happen the last time then when he was the interim head coach? Why not give him the opportunity then instead of three years later? But you do see what he did with the Rams, and he did well there, again, Super Bowl. And it does make me go back and forth. So, like, I'm – I think I go both. I go both ways. I, I see the positives and negatives where I'm like, ooh. Right. I think it's fair to say, well, here we are three years after he was interviewed for the job that he ultimately got three years later. Yeah. I think it's fair to ask that question. I'm sure it will be asked of Arthur Blank when that introductory press conference happens. And I think it's a fair question, and I'm mm. looking forward to hearing kind of what they have to say. I, I also think – from the perspective of having covered Raheem Morris, I know you brought that up. Like, I did cover him for a year. It was, you know, the Falcons go 0-5 to start the 2020 season. Dan Quinn, Thomas Dimitrov are let go. Raheem Morris steps in for the final 11 games of the season as the interim head coach, who's defensive coordinator, prior to that. And I enjoyed my time covering Raheem Morris. He stepped into a situation that, let's be honest, wasn't fun. There was a big target I think on the Falcons just in general just to be better like I, I think that was something that was just when you look back at that time and I'm I, you know time has passed but I just remember kind of feeling like he brought an energy to the team that the team was missing in that moment they were on such a skid they hadn't won a game and and he was a positive force that I think did do wonders for this locker room in that moment in a time that was unprecedented too people forget like the COVID year 2020 like that was really difficult I know for me personally too to have to like try and make connections with this locker room by not being in the locker room for sure trying to make connections with these this coaching staff that have no idea what the what what's going to happen to their jobs after these 11 games are over that was a hard time for everyone and I I do think you have to give credit where credit is due to Raheem Morris for really like Things could have crumbled. Things could have disintegrated. And I think because of his energy and because of the respect that the players had for him at that time was the reason why this team ultimately stayed together. And, you know, I'm, I also just think I always appreciate that win, lose, good days, bad days, when you show up exactly the same every single time and you give respect to people every single day, that that matters to me as a journalist covering a head coach. And I, I can say that about Raheem Morris every single day, every single question, whether it was easy or a hard question, he answered it. He was respectful. And I, I personally liked his energy. I really did. I would like to say that was the one thing I required out of a, out of a coach when we did our round table, <laughs> yeah. being sociable and whatnot, like a good mm-hmm. presence to the public. But going back to how he was as an interim coach, I pulled some of those numbers. Four and seven isn't necessarily something you want to see. But if you look at those losses, there were only two that were double digit. Mm -hmm. And the others were five points or less. So it's not not like they were out of it. They were within one score of five of those seven losses. Within the context of what Tori is saying, with the stress of the COVID year and all the protocols that come with it and the stress of everybody may be blown out of here, yeah. right? That, that there's that. And that happened. Trying to work with a cloud hanging over your head right. in any walk of life is difficult. Imagine yeah. that with cameras everywhere mm-hmm. and your performance being graded on a Sunday. So I, I think that that's a good inside the numbers sort of stat. Mm-hmm. Who, I me? think <laughs> that's important. Um, and the thing that I like about this hire there's something that came on our social media, I think late Thursday night. And it's, uh, it's a video of, there's lots of videos of Raheem Morris dancing. Okay. There are, but there's one where Raheem is dancing after a victory. And then the camera scrolls over and it's Arthur blank also Mm -hmm. dancing in a three piece suit. And I think that that's, that's the type of like infectious energy that comes from a culture where you want to win. Mm-hmm. Now, look, th- that's all well and good. Mm-hmm. You need talent too. Yeah. I can, outside the quarterback spot, Matt Ryan's obviously a legend. Outside the quarterback spot, I'll I'll bet you depth-wise that the team that he's going to inherit is more talented mm-hmm. across the board than what he had before. So what can he do with the talent? How can Terry Fontenot continue to acquire talent mm-hmm. to, to be able to help him out? Uh, before we get into more about 
Uh, Raheem Morris, let's just talk about the search a little bit. Two and a Ooh. half weeks. I'm I, 18 days. Mm -hmm. the, a, a 14 candidates, 18 total interviews. I know that because I overheard Taryn in the office next to me say that to Tori. So I didn't come <laughs> up with it myself. Uh, but I did steal it fair I and get, square. I like the symmetry of 18 days and 18 interviews. Not I, that it was day by day by day, but I, symmetry. Yeah, so 14 first interviews, uh, f four second interviews, and four additional ones scheduled, but they never got to the, the two Lions and two uh, Ravens coaches. But and then there was the first one that never came to fruition. With because the Raiders hired him oh, before they uh, even had Antonio the first interview. Pierce, yeah. Right. So technically, yeah. So there were a lot of candidates. They looked at offensive guys, defensive guys, uh, people with head coaching experience. Of which Raheem Morris is the first head coach hired by Arthur Blank with previous head coaching experience. I think that ain't nothing, by the way. And when you look at at the search in totality, they interviewed Mike Vrabel. They interviewed Jim Harbaugh, who's with the Chargers. Uh, they interviewed Bill Belichick. And that was a driving force, right? We saw the wins of it's a fait accompli, right? Mm -hmm. And then in terms of what the national conversation was. But I think ultimately going with a guy like Raheem Morris, again, just like what you were saying, don't let's not do a tale of the tape. Right. right, because it's it's about what you're getting organizationally and how you can uplift this group. Now, look, his offensive coordinator hire is going to be as important as anything that Raheem Morris does yeah. moving forward. But I guarantee you that when he was in that inter that interview, dude had a plan. Right. And the thing is, there's a quote from at, when he became interim head coach, and he was talking about his time in Tampa Bay when he got hired, and he was. Uh, 32 years old. He had a 10 and six record sandwiched by a three win team and a four win team. Right. Okay. And he has a quote where he says, um, help me Tori, where it, it basically he was talking about that. He was like, I don't know if I was ready for that at that right. point in time in my career. Well, yeah, he said that he was ready, but he wasn't prepared. There you go. Yeah. But there's more to the quote. He said he was ready, but he wasn't prepared in that he wasn't prepared to walk into the owner's office and say, I need this guy. Right. And that's going back to what Taryn was, 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 was talking about the business and the, the CEO nature of being a head coach mm -hmm. is something that it sounds like he's learned. Right. And that's going to be important mm -hmm. if you're working in collaboration with Terry Fontenot who is very good at finding guys that fit what the coach wants to walk in there and say, I know this is going to be 60 million bucks, but I need that guy. Mm -hmm. He and, has a decade since then. Right. And that's part of it. And I think it's, it's a combination of this guy's worked with Aaron Donald. Mm -hmm. He's worked with Jalen Ramsey, can, who can be a little mercurial, at least in the national media. Jalen Ramsey spoke out as positively for for Raheem Morris's candidacy as anybody. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the development of two uh, rookie edge rushers mm -hmm. in LA, their names escape me, but they had 17 sacks between them, mm -hmm. right? That you see this combination of being able to develop talent and working with, with star power that's gonna be important as we move forward. So yeah. I think that it's, 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 a, it's an interesting choice Going back to what you were saying, mm -hmm. you can view it on the surface and do a tail of the tape and say, why didn't they hire Belichick? Or why didn't they pay 20 million bucks for Harbaugh or whatever mm -hmm. it would have taken, right? Don't, like, don't do that. Yeah. Dive into it. And that's what we're trying to like, do here is show, all right, this is why they chose this guy. Right. It's more than just basics. I think, too, that like, I, something I can say for Raheem is that like, he's a leader of men. And I know that that's always kind of like a cliche way to talk about like the head coach and, and everything. But I, I really feel like the Falcons at this point in time, they need a leader of men. They need someone who's a game manager. They need somebody who is going to kind of look at the team in a totality and be able to lead the team. And I, I mean, everybody is talking about this whole like Dan Campbell ex experience right. in Detroit and how we're seeing Detroit have success at a level that they haven't had success in ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I, and they're talking about how when Dan Campbell was hired and I'm not like, this is apples to oranges. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, but this is just the analogy that came to mind, but you're talking about how Dan Campbell was a guy who came in and he had an energy about him. It wasn't necessarily that it was like, oh, this guy's a great 
prolific play caller. This guy is can go in and encourage men and lead them and be good for a locker room. And we see the success that they've had in recent years. And I, I, I can't overlook that piece of it, that Raheem Morris, because of everything that everybody else has said, I know that there's a quote in here from, I believe, yeah, it's from general manager Les Need from the – the Rams, and he said, this guy is coded to respect everyone, to build a relationship with everyone, no matter where you're at in the organization. What's awesome is, as he does that, you just see the respect flow back in his direction. He's coded for that. It's a superpower that I think would help any organization. Superpower. Ta- like, yeah. take take away, like, play calling, take away all that. If you have someone who can lead a group of men, tr- build a staff around him to play call and trust that they're going to get the job done, too, I I do think that there is a recipe for success in that when you have a figurehead as much as as anything. Yeah, and that was not part of the outline, but I think is a fascinating (laughs) point that if you look at the Lions, looking at the Lions as a model, things you never thought that you'd say. Right, yeah. But there's there's been a a trend, and it's worked in a lot of places, Mm -hmm. where you go get a hot young coordinator that's going to come in and scheme it up and call plays, yeah. right? That that's the influence that you go to. The Falcons talk to a lot of guys like that, and there's going to be a lot of good hires from that mold. Right. But if you look at what the Lions did, to your point, uh, and I'm kind of externally processing mm-hmm. here, but they hired this figurehead <laughs> mm-hmm. who did a great job hiring Aaron Glenn and Ben Johnson, right. guys who both got second interviews uh, at least uh, requests right. with the Falcons mm-hmm. and that he trusts Ben Johnson to do what he did with Jared Goff and mm-hmm. that offensive line and that running back core. And he trusted Aaron Glenn, despite his defensive background, I'm sure he contributes, Oh yeah, but he and Aaron Glenn have developed a tough, hard nosed defense that made the most out of their draft picks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Brian Branch, Aiden Hutchinson, mm-hmm. you see that group kind of come together right. so it's a different type of model mm-hmm. but it's one that we've seen be successful yeah. here and i keep going back to what arthur blank said the what you brought up the business of being a head coach the ceo mm-hmm. model yeah. and that i don't know if raheem's gonna call a place maybe he will maybe he right? will yeah but then you go and you invest heavily with dollars and cents Mm -hmm. into these coordinators and these position coaches to make sure that on game day, you trust everything that's happening behind you. And if you got to make a tough choice in the moment, Mm -hmm. you can do that. Um, We talked all about that. Taryn, what does your notebook tell you about Raheem Morris's time in life? Just give us some highlights from what's a very extensive, um, (laughs) notated piece of paper. Hey, leave my notebook alone. I'm also glowing because we are just emphasizing what I wrote in the round table throughout this entire podcast. (laughs) Um, Well, I looked at the Rams defense when Morris was the defensive coordinator there. Obviously, in 2021, they won the Super Bowl. And during that time, the defense had uno, dos, tres, cuatro, four big statistics in the top ten. That was passing touchdowns allowed, rushing yards allowed. Uh, the red zone defense was ranked eighth best in the league, and then they were number 10 in turnovers. I guess I'll give you the numbers for the other two I mentioned. Second in passing touchdowns allowed and six in rushing yards allowed. 2022, we know they took a dip in production overall because they were 5-12 and 12 at the end of the season and did not make the playoffs. But they were the number one red, do- red zone defense in the NFL. Even then? Even then. And then they were number 10 in rushing touchdowns allowed. There were no other top 10s mm-hmm. that year. But then 2023, this year, they went 10 and 7 and finished in the wild card, but lost. And honestly, they actually didn't have any top 10s mm-hmm. in those statistical categories. Yeah. So we lost me there a bit. But um, the fact that even last year, with the struggles that that team had to have the number one red zone defense in the league, says a lot about what Morris is able to do in a difficult time. Um, regardless, I already said how when he was the interim head coach, the losses weren't that big, regardless of the 4-7 and seven record looking like it did. He has two Super Bowls to his name. If you want to count the 2002 with the Buccaneers when he was a defensive quality control coach, obviously 2021, which I already mentioned. Yeah. Any specific numbers you'd like to know? I think I think you hit it. I, I think that's a good cross-section. And it, it, again, the, the, the context of you look at the Rams' defense for so long and there is so much like star power. Mm-hmm. 
not as much Mm -hmm. this year. And Mm -hmm. they still found a way to make it work. I think all those things are important. They're still like top 20. Yeah. And they were still able to generate pressure, something that's important. And I think he's going to enjoy working with Jesse Bates. Right. Um, Reuniting with Grady What defensive mind wouldn't? (laughs) Right. Yeah. There's one thing that we're certain of is that he knows how to use uh, defensive tackles. So um, there's been a lot obviously discussed about Raheem Morris. And let's just go to Terry Fontenot. Um, Nobody likes reading quotes all the time, but I think that some of these are important. Uh, I'm beyond excited to work side by side with Raheem in bringing a championship to Atlanta. We've conducted one of the most thorough and comprehensive searches and saw many incredible candidates through this process. Raheem is the right fit for our team culture and shared vision for our success in Atlanta. And I cannot wait to start working with him and have his energy in our building. The word right fit. I mm-hmm. want to like highlight that because every time you talk to Terry about the roster, he doesn't talk about the best 53. He talks about the right 53. He talks about the right fit here, mm-hmm. the right fit for this coach. And when you talk about Terry Fontenot as the general manager here, mm-hmm. that I think it's also pertinent at this time to read a section of the uh, press release announcing Raheem Morris's can candid sorry not candidacy, candidacy. hiring yeah candidate as a candidate being hired there you go. Uh, anyway more reading from Scott uh, the Atlanta Falcons are naming Raheem Morris as the team's new head coach Morris and Falcons GM Terry Fontenot will report directly to Arthur M Blank Atlanta Falcons owner and chairman on all football matters. Rich McKay remains CEO of AMBSE and continues to represent the team on league matters at the NFL's and the NFL's competition committee. Greg Beatles remains president of the Falcons and will continue overseeing all day-to-day business operations. So what you should take from that Thank you. is that for the last – so when Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith were hired, they reported to Rich McKay, who reported to Arthur Blank. That is no longer the case. Raheem Morris and Terry Fano will report directly to Arthur Blank. Right. And and that's that's a shift mm-hmm. after a lot of conversation in the first uh, in the post Arthur Smith parting ways press conference about the structured order. And they were talking a lot, especially Arthur Blank, about trying to find that 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 partnership between mm-hmm. head coach and GM. Mm-hmm. And that's what it seems like that they are going to establish, that that uh, Raheem is going to be in charge of football operations and the football team. Terry is going to be in charge of personnel. It's going to be that working relationship, that which I think ultimately the Falcons wanted to create. And that triangle leads up to Arthur Blank, who is obviously the expectations are high, but it, I think it was important because with all the news and everybody's looking at the head coach, seeing how this organizational shift plays out, mm-hmm. I think is a relevant thing to bring up mm-hmm. as we move forward. And it really, in my opinion, kind of emphasizes Terry Fontenot's role and importance in this organization. And I think it's warranted because if you go back to the first, what Arthur Blank was saying, he talked back on Jan, in early January mm-hmm. about the, the track record of what Terry Fontenot has done with his draft picks. Not everybody agrees with that, every single one, mm-hmm. and that he's been a really good general manager. Maybe he said great, but it, w- it was a positive statement about what Terry Fontenot has done here. Um, I, and I, I think it's a good way, if you want to win now, s- keep one part stable. The personnel department is stable. You're not starting over. You're not changing philosophies on, on that side. I think that can be an accelerant if you bring in a good culture guy mm-hmm a guy who can activate things and you have a personnel department who trust each other and they can just keep going yeah. with the draft and free agency process. To me, it wasn't this whole thing. And what I think the hiring of Raheem Morris shows you is that the Falcons were not looking for a change in philosophy. They were looking to enhance the philosophy that they already have set. Right. Mm-hmm. And that is what I feel like this hire of Raheem Morris says, because if you were to pick someone else who wanted to come in here and fundamentally change the culture, fundamentally change the philosophy, then it kind of does create this like butting of heads between the head coach and the general manager, especially if you have this model of it's 50 percent, 50 percent and uh, of control of the organization. So when I when I look at this, when I read about this, when I, you know, hopefully when we get the chance to talk to Terry Fontenot, Raheem Morris, Arthur Blank, et cetera, et cetera, 
I, I feel like that's almost the emphasis that they should have is that it's like, we did this to enhance what we feel like we have in the building right now. Especially because Raheem Morris has already been in this building. Right. And while there's been a ton of turnover from when he was here the, the, the last time, there is gener there is some continuity in the building. He knows mm -hmm. who Greg Beatles is. He knows who a, a, like a lot of the support staff yeah. below the names that you know mm -hmm. are. Yeah. So in terms of enhancing that, that philosophy and continuing what they consider an upward uh, trajectory, mm -hmm. that this is the way that you can infuse a guy that's familiar, a culture guy, an energy guy, and a guy who can um, work well and merge with what Terry Fontenot's done a lot of good work, not mm -hmm. only in terms of draft and free agency, um, but also in terms of clearing up cap issues, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that they can kind of merge and then continue upward. So that's what I think the moral of this story is. Yeah. And it's it's been a fascinating one, mm -hmm. right? We're dealing with major players and major yeah. names on the national stage. I wonder how much of an emphasis this, con I feel like I need to talk with my hands because y'all were. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I can't do it. But I wonder <laughs> nice try, though. You almost Gotta had it. Clench in my lap. But I wonder how much of a topic of conversation this was in the interview process. Like, how willing are these candidates to do this 50 50 relationship? Because, you know, some of them were big names. Mm -hmm. Right. Who may not have wanted that. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, you would. I would love to be a fly on the wall for all of these 18 interviews, but what I don't if, get paid for that. If um, they could have turned this into that, like, uh, that like Netflix F1 documentary style. Like, hey, we're ooh, living in not F1 up when I'm in a NASCAR either. <laughs> I was gonna say like drive hard knocks. Just, right. <laughs> we're living uh, in a hard knocks world. We are, um, but that would be fascinating. Yeah. And okay, so, and there's so many questions that we don't have answers to because we're recording this podcast the morning after the hiring announcement. Yeah, I think there's, Scott and I left at like 10 o'clock. Uh -huh. like 12 hours later. Yeah, yeah, and there's gonna be plenty more to discuss mm -hmm. because there's going to be a press conference. We're going to hear from Terry Fontenot and Arthur Blank and yeah. Raheem Morris beyond some of these statements mm -hmm. through these press conferences. And we're going to see not only what they say, but then the actions that back them up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We're already as Actions crazy. speak louder than words. Right. We're getting, we're getting ready to start an coordinator tracker as we speak Ayo. because there's <laughs> another phase to this thing. So, oh boy. so I, I think the it's- The grind don't stop, no. as they and, say. And 18 days and counting. <laughs> it is. 19 days and counting now. And I, I think it's gonna be fascinating to see how it all turns out because, oh yeah, uh, I think the Falcons are gonna be examining some quarterbacks over the course of the next couple months too. Lord, yeah. So yeah, that's another part of this whole thing. It's like, we haven't even scratched the surface of kind of what the biggest, I, I mean, the head coach was always gonna be a big topic of yeah. conversation, of course. Coordinators, big topic of conversation, but I think- You need the, your Rudolph. The one. <laughs> We found our Santa. <laughs> Good Lord. For wow. those who have listened to the previous the, episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm ignoring that analogy. <laughs> it's but not no, Christmas I mean, anymore. The quarterback yes. conversation is one is that's going one. to be the biggest question of the offseason. Yeah. And to watch this offseason play out is going to be fascinating. So will all the um, discussions and conversations that we're going to have with some of these new pieces of the organization to see if they can, in fact – merge together and continue and continue moving up and fulfill what will be high expectations in 2024 also get excited you know yeah. like this is uh, new season who dis? yeah oh. like new era like let's let's go into this i think with an open mind uh but i, I mean i know i'm pretty excited to get raheem in the building because i personally really like Raheem as a person. So I'm I, excited to meet him. Right. So, yeah. And I too enjoy wearing my hat backwards. So this will be licensed yeah, I, for that. I feel like everyone should know that when it we found out that it, Raheem was being hired, <laughs> Scott was wearing a hat and he proceeded for the rest of the day to turn it backwards. Yeah. I mean, solidarity, I think. Uh, okay. We could go. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> we could go on forever because I think this is a fascinating choice among some fascinating options yeah and now that they've made it now it's time to turn the page and we're going to have more falcons final whistles for you throughout the course of the off season so for taryn and tori i'm scott thank you so much for listening rating reviewing and subscribing to the atlanta falcons podcast and oh subscribe to our atlanta falcons youtube channel why don't you while you're at it thank you so much we'll talk to you again probably post press conference let's be honest yeah probably and you'll hear from us yeah sooner <laughs> rather than later see ya